let's talk about building performance analysis. Okay, building analysis is another example of after you've gone through the work of creating a building model, you want to go ahead and get the value out of it to understand different aspects of it. So last time we took a look at trying to understand the structural requirements and whether we were going to head and meeting of the code requirements and just making sure that the structure was going to stand up. Today we'll look at energy and really the amount of energy we're consuming, the amount of energy that's being introduced to our building, and really try to think about how we can optimize some of our design features so that we're taking advantage and just being in a nice symbiotic relationship with the environment, that we're doing something that's going to really maximize the sustainability and not be a big burden on the environment, or really a high operating cost building that'll be very expensive to maintain and operate over the next 50, 60 years. Okay. Building performance analysis is a little bit different than structural analysis in this sense. In structural analysis, your goal tends to be fairly well defined in that the building codes will typically give you requirements that you have to meet that have been well uh, considered and thought out very carefully that you need to be carrying these sorts of loads and you need to be able to carry this size of an earthquake load and these factors should work together in very prescribed ways. So it's a little bit easier problem in that the goal state has been given to you. It's kind of a deterministic thing. Building performance analysis is a little bit different. It's a much more open-ended problem because when we talk about greenness and sustainability, everyone has a slightly different goal in mind. Okay. Some people like to think about greenness in terms of, oh, I want to have just the absolute minimum carbon footprint. So I want to minimize the amount of CO2 being consumed by the materials or in the operating life of the building. Yeah. Other people will say, no, that's not what I'm after. I really want to create a building that's going to be either net zero or maybe even be just able to live off the grid completely. Okay, and that will drive you to sort of a different solution. Okay. Other people will say, no, my concern really is I'm all about the long-term operating costs of the building, so I want to do some solution that's really going to be optimizing the amount of money that I'm going to be spending on heating and cooling and operating the building for the next 50 years. And all these different people and considerations are going to drive you towards different solutions. Because what sometimes is the best thing to do from a money standpoint isn't necessarily the best thing to do from a carbon standpoint. Sometimes coming up with a very optimal carbon solution is very well in terms of the payback period you're willing to invest in. Okay? So uh, sometimes doing things that are going to maximize your money won't be the kindest to the environment. Okay, so you have to be sort of explicit as part of the project team in figuring out what the goal is you're trying to optimize. Everyone, otherwise everyone is saying green, but they're meaning different things. Okay, and you're heading towards just sort of a, a shifting target. Okay, so be careful about that as we go into the building performance analysis, because not everyone has the same objective. Okay, and it's, it's not implicit about what that objective should be. As we do the building performance analysis, there's a basic workflow we're going to be following. And really the whole idea behind what we're doing is we're trying to get some early design feedback. More than anything, that's what we're after doing. So, it said, we will go through and design the entire building, and just as part of the submission and compliance checks, we will estimate the energy use of the building, and we'll do that really just to document that we've done a good job with our design. Okay. Now, that's an okay thing. We did that for years. But the idea is now that even more important than just documenting that we did a good job, wouldn't it be better to actually understand as we go how we're doing, and then based on the feedback we're getting from our analysis, continue to fine tune our design so it does an even better job. So it's not just an end point about informing the entire journey, so that as we go through the whole process, it's not an end process. It's really an iterative thing where we do some modeling and things like Revit or ARCHICAD or even Vectorworks. We can export our model in a format that allows us to interchange with an analysis package. We can do some analysis of the thermal performa performance, maybe the daylighting, to some aspect we're trying to look at, and then we can use the results to go through and revise our design and keep on going into the next round. What happens is if we can get that early feedback and incorporate it into our design, it's much easier to make changes like to reorient the building or change our window scheme or add new shading features to the windows early on in the design process. It's very, very hard after just, oh, you know, this is really doing a very poor job in terms of the sun and how it's coming through the windows. We need to change the entire window scheme. Okay. Yeah, at that point, people are so locked in, they're not going to want to even hear your feedback. 
will say, that's going to be a problem for the operator of the building. That's not my problem. We'll pass it off. Okay. Whereas it's nice to get that feedback early. And that's what we're going to try and do with these tools. In getting ready for the building performance analysis, it all starts with basically getting your model ready in Revit so that we're ready to go. And as we go through and put our model in Reddit, Revit, get it ready to import into the building performance tools, okay, we're going to start by actually creating a little unit model. So the same thing I said structural software, rather than taking your giant four-story, all these sort of interesting architectural features building in and trying to analyze it, let's start by just creating something very simple that we can predict what we think its performance will be, see how the analysis tool does, and then see if we can control the behavior of what we're getting as the analysis results. Much better to understand, are you procedurally getting the file across and getting all the links on a very simple model? If your model starts out being very complex, you're just going to get numbers back, and you'll have no idea whether or not they're reasonable. OK, so for the very simple building. So what I'm going to do is actually go back over into Revit and make myself just a very simple little model building. Just enough to get ourselves started so that we can uh, go through and just see what some of the real high-level effects are when we take it into the performance analysis. Hmm. Well, you can remind me in seven days. You wonder how many times I'm going to keep pushing that before I'm finally going to say no. <laughs> Maybe in the future. Everything sounds good seven days from now. I'll say, let's create a new Revit project file. Here we are. There's going to be very few rules to this new project. I'm going to cre create something that's relatively simple, so it'll be fairly rectangular in shape. I'll just grab some walls. I'm not going to worry too much about the wall types just yet. I'm going to sort of assign some materials for the walls and their thermal properties in the other program. The idea is here, this is sort of a very just conceptual early stage in the process. So I'm going to pull out something, oh, maybe about that big. Now, oh, I want this to be a little bit more interesting than one big old room, so let me break it up into two rooms. I'll say, I'll put a dividing line in here, as though we're going to have two rooms. Okay, to, oh, I should put some doors and windows in here. Let me get the door tool. We'll need some way to get into this building, so maybe we'll put a door over here. To get in that main room, maybe we'll also have sort of a doorway over here. I can flip that. Maybe a doorway over here also to this little secondary room. Maybe this thing needs an emergency exit on the back. Okay. And we'll also put some windows in there. I can put some windows in. I'll just use these kind of standard size windows right now. I'll put some over here on the east side of the building. Maybe some over here on the south side. I'm going to go ahead and actually, as I'm thinking about my building, one of the ideas I have in mind is that really I might want to have some oh, large glazed area facing south that'll capture a lot of solar energy through the day to help me heat the building. So I'll just go ahead and put that in as sort of an early design feature. We can sort of test to see whether that's a very good feature or not, or whether I'm being very smart about doing that. So what I'll do is I'll do a very quick modify. I'll split this wall right there. I just go through and I'm going to change that to a curtain wall. Oh, we'll do that in just a moment, actually. Just a very brief moment. That's a very good point because that's one of the next things we're going to do. Okay, so there's my basic little building right now. So we need to go ahead and put that building somewhere in space and we need to give it the right orientation, as you're suggesting. So let's do that. To do that, what I can do is I'm going to go over here to Manage. And under Manage, I'll actually find something called the location. This is where I can give it a geographic location. So I'll choose a place, oh, maybe Boston, or I'm going to go through and choose, oh, I'll choose Bridgeport, Connecticut. Why not? I want someplace that's a little bit cool during the wintertime. The effects will be easier to see there. The problem with working in Palo Alto just choose it because it's our home base, but it's the, the climate here is so moderate, it's really hard to see the effect of things. It's been cold the last few nights, but overall, 
it's pretty darn nice here throughout the year. We don't really get very high summer temperatures very cool. So it's almost too kind as an analysis or an environment to and analyze. Okay. The other thing we are going to do is not only place it somewhere on the face of the earth, which will determine its latitude and longitude and affect how the sun hits our building, we're going to take a look at the orientation. And as Farzam suggested, right now we have this thing called the project orientation. The bottom, north being the top, east and west. That's really more a convenience. That's a, a convention that we're using just to describe the bottom and the top that we have just something to hang on to and describe those different sides. That's not truly the solar orientation, okay? And if we want to go through and put the true orientation of the building in there, because very few buildings actually are truly oriented north and south, just like this, okay? What we're gonna do is as follows. There's a setting right over here where we can rotate the, tr or the orientation, but to do it, what we have to do is do it in the plan view. So I'm gonna get out of the 3D view and go to the plan view. Now, by default, what happens is the plan views are set up to show the project orientation. That's nice, because we like the drawings to be square to the sheets. That makes them easy to read. Okay. But if I want to go through and change the true orientation, what I'm going to do is actually duplicate that view. I'll have a different view here, and I can rename this. I'll just call it the true orientation. And then in that view, I can change its properties. So instead of showing the project north, it shows the true north. Okay, now we can change it. Now, some of you may recognize this is exactly what we did when I was talking about rendering and setting up the sun so we got accurate shadows. Same basic procedure. We have our building. We're showing the true orientation. Now if I go to the Manage tab and say, change the true north, rotate it, I have basically this vector that I can use to swing the orientation around. It's sort of centered right down here. What happens with this rotation vector is I can go ahead and just click it at one location and then pull the angle that I want to go ahead and rotate it. So if I want to go through and rotate this thing counterclockwise a few degrees, like 20 degrees, I can click it. Okay, and now what's going to happen is south is heading straight this way. That big window is facing slightly southeast as opposed to southwest. Okay. Now, you can go ahead and set the location and the orientation. You can either do it in Revit or you can do it in the other programs. You can do it in Green Building Studio or do it in Ecotech. I do it here as a starting point just so I have it kind of built into my model so my shadows are accurate and everything's looking good. Okay, let's go on back out. So we got a nice oh, building. It's almost ready, except for just a few problems. You might notice that it doesn't have a floor and it doesn't have a roof. And when we're doing building performance analysis, that could be a problem because all of our heat's going to go out in the two different directions. We need to enclose those volumes. So it's important that we actually go through and just go through and set up rooms and volumes that are fully enclosed. You do have to put walls. In either or floors and either roofs or ceilings or floors above. You have to have something that's going to cap it. Otherwise, all you have no separation between you and the outside air. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. I'll come back over and on level one, I'll put a floor under this thing. I'm going to go very fast because this should be old hat to you by now. I got a floor element. I'll pick some walls. I'll just kind of go around, flip that to the outside. I got a floor under my building now. That should be looking good. Let me shade that so you can see it. Okay, now let's put a roof on this thing too. I'll do that on level two. And for my roof, I'll do a footprint roof. Put a little overhang on it. I'll just pick the different walls. For these other walls, I'm going to say that they don't have a slope. Interesting. Let me just trim those two. It's just kind of a funny one. When you have a wall made of a lot of different segments and you know you want the roof edge to be equal, it's often better just to trim the edges against each other and have the line continue that way as opposed to try and select all the individual segments. So that's what I'm going to do there. And for this slope, oh, that 9 and 12 sounds so, so steep. Maybe about 3 and 12. 
Should I attach the walls? I'll say yes. Let's see what's going on. Okay, well, it looks like it's still 9 and 12. <laughs> People have noticed what I often do in class is I say okay and then I click cancel. So, there's our basic little building. It's in pretty good shape. It's got a floor, it's got a roof, it's going to hold the heat in and separate it from the outside. Now, as we go through and do our work, we need to go through and also add rooms to this because rooms are going to become very important elements to us. The idea is as follows. When we take these things over for analysis, it doesn't actually take every last object out of your Revit model. It really just takes a simplified surface model. And what it does is it takes rooms, rooms that are made up by the walls that create a room, the floor, any of the, floor, the ceiling or the roof above, okay? And it uses those surfaces to model the building. It just uses the boundaries. And then for each of those different boundaries, you assign some thermal properties, you assign some color and reflectance properties about how the light's going to bounce around. You just sort of create this simplified model, but it's all based on the rooms, not the actual walls. Okay? So to make that work, what we do is as follows. I will go back into the floor plan view, and I'm going to place some rooms in here. I'll put a room over here. I'll put a room over there. And I can give those two rooms some names. Oh, I'm going to call this one the office. I'm going to call this one the computer lab. Those names are actually going to be useful to us when we get over to the other program because those are going to come through as what are called zones where we can assign different occupancy codes, different hours of operation to the different rooms. So those names are helpful. It will help you later go ahead and figure out which zone you're talking about. Now, rooms are pretty easy and we haven't really, we, they've been just using the, using the wall boundaries considering the area of the room. We haven't actually thought very much about how high they are, okay, and how high they go up to sort of actually, you know, figure out where the ceiling is. And by default, let me show you how it's set up. If I look at the instance properties, you'll see that the rooms by default limit themselves to starting at level one, but then going up to 10 feet, okay, above level one. And that may not be a good choice, okay, because if I have very tall ceilings like have ceilings that are probably about 12 feet tall, maybe even 13 feet tall. Okay. If I cut it off at 10 feet, it won't actually find that ceiling. Okay. So I'll still have a room which is unbounded because it just didn't look high enough. Okay. There is a ceiling up there. We just are saying, how high do you want to keep looking before you actually find something? So if you have a vaulted ceiling that comes down or you have a two-story space or even like a four or five-story uh, Okay, you may have to go through and set the room limit very, very high. What's going to happen? There's no penalty for setting it high. I can set that to be 100 feet for all that matters. Because what's going to happen is that's just as far as it's going to look. If it turns out, that's interesting. That killed it. <laughs> Don't set it to 100. It didn't like that. Let's go for 30. I'll be more modest. Okay, if I set it to 30, what's going to happen is it's going to start on the floor, it's going to look up to 30 feet, but if it encounters a ceiling or a floor or a roof along the way, it'll stop. So all you're really saying is how high do you want to go look? That's all it is. Okay, so I'm going to let it look up to 30 just so I can be sure to capture that. Okay, so I got my rooms in, I've set the tops of the rooms to be high enough to make sure that I actually capture the ceiling. The very last thing I have to do is follows. If you go through and take a look at the rooms, you will see, oh, I want to do one other thing. I want to actually set the other room over here too. Let me show you my quick shortcut for doing that. You'll find that I do this a lot from here on out. I drag around the entire building, and if I want to get all the rooms, I'll filter turn off things, and then go back and grab just the room objects. That's kind of a quickie way of selecting multiple things. So if I don't want to go through and select them individually, I can do that. Then type in values that apply to all the different elements selected. Okay, so 
quick selection. Watch out for that one because I, I do that a lot. I just drag around things and filter to only get uh, select the things that I was interested in. But here's what I wanted to show you is volume. You notice the issue of volume says not computed now. Let's talk about why that is. Okay. Yes. Where's on? Yeah, we're just keeping it as one level for now. It would, it would just the same thing. Okay. By default, Revit realizes that hey, calculating the volumes of all these things time. So I'm going to turn that one off. You may not be so interested in the volume of your rooms. Most people don't really care about the volumes of your rooms. They don't think that way. We are going to care about that because we have to compute in terms of figuring the heating and cooling loads. So rather than kind of leaving it set to its default of not computing it, we're going to go over on the Home tab and under Room and Area, you'll find there's actually Area and Volume Computations. And this is where we can say compute the areas only or compute the areas and volumes. Okay, I'm going to turn on the volumes. Now, that's one that's really easy to forget to do. But don't worry because if you go ahead and start trying to export this thing as GBXML, okay, if you haven't turned on volumes, it'll say, wait, 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 you haven't turned on your volumes. Are you sure you don't want to turn on your volumes? You really should turn on your volumes. And the answer is, okay, go ahead and turn on the volumes. Okay, so if you get that message, that's all that's going on. It just means you forgot it. Okay, I'll let you turn them on now. So it, it, it won't let you go wrong, but if you get that warning, that's what's going on. Okay, so I'll turn on the volumes. If you want to see what the volumes are, you can even kind of check out under the room tags. I can see what the area of the rooms are. I can actually show me the volumes. Let me turn on the volumes over here the area or the volume. Okay, That's a property of the room tag. If your room tag doesn't have areas and volumes loaded and you want to sort of see a room tag that does, you can load in a new room tag that does by, oh, what do I do? I'll say insert, I'll load a family, and if you go to annotations, where'd it go? There's the room tag. If you load in the latest version of room tag, it includes the volume and the area as one of the options that you can display in the room tag. Sometimes that's handy to do. Can't pull that out. Okay, so you'll see that right now this, this big computer lab is about 32,880 square feet. If you want to confirm for yourself that things are working properly, try something simple like just moving the wall around a little bit. Okay, and you should see that the volume computes. Okay, that's giving me hope that things are looking good. Let me try one other thing just to confirm that things are going good. And that is, I really want to make sure that volume includes the roof. So I've got this 33, almost 34,000 cubic feet in there right now. If I go to the 3D view and I change the slope of the roof, I would expect that if I'm going to change the slope of the roof to say 512, Okay, that the volume of the room is going to change too. So let's go back and we'll confirm that, that actually happened. 41, okay, looking pretty good. I am satisfied in my mind that this model is what, bounding on all sides. It's complete. It has rooms in it that are computing the volumes. I think we're good on the model. Okay, so if you're good on the model in Revit, go ahead and save it away. We'll say, uh, oh, where do I want to put that? I'm going to put it in my documents. And then under session 16, I will call it class 3A. Okay, save it away. Okay, so first thing is just get your Revit model all set up. Once you have your Revit model all set up, you're ready to take it over to the analysis program. And if you're ready, I'm ready. What we're going to do is as follows. We're going to go to the export menu and choose export as GBXML. GBXML is Green Building Extensible Markup Language, which is really just a fancy way of saying it's a text file where all the different building surfaces are encoded as text using tags that allow almost any program to read them. Okay, so I'll show you what that looks like in a second. After we export the building model data, we can import it over into another program. Today we're going to look at Ecotect Analysis. There are some other programs. Next Tuesday we're going to look at something called Green Building Studio. There's two different programs. Ecotech Analysis, I would say, characterize it 
focuses on the science. It talks about the BTUs and it talks about temperature. It talks about sort of the scientific values. Green Building Studio goes one step further and it factors in the local costs of electricity and of fuel and of water and converts all that into a lot of economic numbers. So if you're interested in sort of thinking about things in terms of dollars as opposed to BTUs, Green Building Studio, kind of sort of figure out what you're looking at. Okay, let's go ahead and give that a try. See what it looks like. Come back over here. I got my model. We're ready to go. Under the application menu, you will find export. And at export, you will find GBXML. Go ahead and choose that. You will see this is the simplified model of the building. Okay, it looks like those big blue things. As you look at this, there's some things that we can change. One thing you want to watch out for is which project phase you're working with. Because if you have a multi-phase building, okay, like we have, or in this case we don't, if you were working on assignment four and trying to do this, you would have to consider the right project phase. Okay, get the data version because all these different phases encoded in there. So go ahead and make sure you got the right phase. Okay. For complexity, and let's kind of show you what that's all about. The idea is you try to keep things as simple as possible. So you can say simple, simple with shadings. What happens is you move down that ladder, you're just breaking this building up into more and more discrete surfaces. Okay, and for it's probably okay. Just kind of keep it very, you know, early on. Leave the model simple. Okay, simple would be just the blue zones. The doors and windows will come through as separate surfaces. The big curtain wall will come through as one big surface. It won't even break it into separate pieces of glass. It'll be one big surface. Okay? The roof plane will come in. These eaves, the overhangs, won't come in. If we want them to come in, we'd have simple with shading surfaces. And then those eaves, those overhangs, which aren't really thermally active, but they do shade the building because they're surrounded by outside air, but they do have the shading effect. Okay. If we want those, we'll consider surfaces. So complex, what's going to happen is it'll break the curtain wall into more segments. And if you go complex with mullions, it'll also bring in the mullions as part of the curtain wall. Okay. The truth is, it's really not very important to us at this level to get to that level of complexity. Because for what we're doing in terms of just thinking about how much light's coming in through that big curtain wall or how much heat's flowing out, it's okay to think of it as one big glass piece. You don't really have to kind of break it down. So I'm going to say just, oh, simple with the shading surfaces. I think it's a pretty good compromise. Let me say OK. Oops. I don't want to say OK. What I want to say is export. Back again. We'll say export. And now I can go through and say, class 3A, export from Revit.xml. Jeez Louise, can't type today. Save that away. Okay, let me close out of Revit for right now. Let's kind of hide that away. Let's take a look at what this XML format even looks like, so you can sort of take a look. It's really not all that interesting. If you wanna, if you're curious about what XML looks like, you can double. And you'll see it looks like this. It kind of looks like HTML. It's talking about tags that start and end different elements. The name of the location is Bridgeport, Connecticut. The latitude and the longitude are here. There's a bunch of different definitions of poly loops which are defined by different surfaces. So this is the X, Y, Z coordinates, defining the boundaries of those things. And using this language, it's able to go through and bring those surfaces into other programs that aren't Revit. And having that ability to kind of take a surface model to any program it in XYZ is actually very, very useful. It gives you sort of a nice interchange way that you know, makes it so that no one's dependent on which tool you started with. Because you could be doing this in SketchUp. You could be doing a lot of different tools in generating these surfaces. It doesn't have to be Revit.